Good evening, my name is Barbara Cheeves and I have the honor of um, working with the city on this initiative and we're working with them for a little over a year on this initiative now. I'm thrilled to be a part of it and I'm going to be your MC for the evening and the next two nights that we do this. So before I turn this over, I think it's really important to know who's in the room, but there's a lot of you here. So here's my rule, name and where you represent either your business or your neighborhood affiliation or your company, but just name and who. No resumes, no commercials, no none of them. Okay, just who you are and who you represent. Uh, and I'm going to start here. Edric. Uh, Pop up, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Reverend Robert Brown. I'm the uh, Chief Affairs Outreach Ministries. Thank you. Good afternoon, Nina Jacobson with Youth Services Department. Good evening, I follow with the County Youth Services. Hello, I'm Sharon Good with the Florida Department of Health. Good afternoon, I'm Sandy Jr. with the YWCA. Hi, I'm Sean Gurdon, New City Innovators. Hello, I'm Dr. Deborah Robinson, Vice Chair of Public County School Board. I'm Bill Nugent, I'm the host and producer of the City Voice podcast and the Vice President of the Randy Lights Neighborhood Association. Hi, I'm Charles Boyle, I'm the husband of the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, y'all. Anthony Smith, City United. Hello, everyone. Hang with your family services. Good evening, Marsha Duff, the Children's Services Council. Good evening, James Green, I'm with the Palm Beach County Youth Service Council. Community service. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's promoted and forget. <laughs> I'm Bill Washington, uh, pastor of Fresh Air Baptist Church. Hi, good evening. I'm Corey Nearing, uh, West Palm Beach City Commission. We'll come down here. Good evening, Sean Terrell, E Roll Map Organization. <laughs> good evening, Daryl Houston with Community Foundation um, with Mark Townsend. Good evening, I'm Sarah Mooney, the Chief of the West Palm Beach Police Department. Hi, I'm Bruce Lewis in custody of the chief police chief. For the night's off, that could be true. Hi, I'm Teresa Johnson, representing Wealth West Community Consortium and this beautiful community that you're sitting in now. Hi, I'm Leanne T. Brown. I'm a small business owner. I'm a member of the Black Chamber of Palm Beach County, and I started an organization called Free Girls Club. And then we'll go with you. My name is Vaughn Moore. I am from the Holy Athletic Week. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Robin Johnson Blake from Palm Beach State College. Good evening. Happy Tuesday. I'm Shandra Schroon with Prosperous Consulting. Whitney Davis, the Lower's Place. I'm Catherine Murphy, the National Alliance of Mental Illness. Craig Spatera, Palm Beach County Public Safety Department. My name is Kyrie Kelly, and I represent West Palm Beach. I'm Seth Lennon. Yeah. Over here. Michael Logan, Alvin Sarah, Palm Beach. Ronnie Perry, Pastor New Song Church, and Tennessee Innovators. Yeah. And I'm Joseph Free Girl Scholarship Foundation, male and female academic and athletic assistants. Thank you. Sam in the back. And before West Palm Beach, uh, please let me know. Thank you. And you just walked in? Yamari Rivera with the North Museum of Art. Hi. Vaughn Arthur with Vaughn Arthur Fitz. Thank you. And one more? No, two more. Okay, I didn't see you back there. Ricky Aiken, Inner City Innovators. Inner City Innovators. Oh, Earl Thank you. Andrew Anna, Barbara, and Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming out this evening. First, I'm going to turn you over to the uh, the brains behind uh, the Mayor's Village Initiative, your mayor, Jerry Moya. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to learn about um, a group called, or an organization called Cities United, uh, something that a group of mayors had put together um, to address the outcomes of young African-American males in our community. I joined and became part of that, and as a result, um, I was smart enough to hire Kevin Jones um, to lead it, and we're now calling it the Mayor's Village Initiative. 
this is going to be a great opportunity for you all to help us shape the direction we want to go in over the next few years. That's why we're here. We want you to help us to figure out what would be the best strategies and tactics for us to move forward and what areas we should focus on. So thank you for being here. I'm very excited that we're doing this. This is the first, as Barbara said, of three uh, opportunities for the community to have input into um, where we're going with this. And I'm just so glad so many of you turned out tonight to join us. So thank you for being here. Um, now it's my honor to introduce Kevin Jones, who is in charge of the Mayor's Village. Kevin. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and once again, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, just so grateful uh, that everyone is here. And uh, this is a work that's very, um, very near and dear to my heart. And I know it is to your, you all's hearts as well, because that's why you are here. So uh, basically, I just want to give a, a brief you know, overview of the Mayor's Village Initiative. Uh, so it's a, a program or an initiative where we're looking at probably the three most distressed neighborhoods in our city, the three most violent neighborhoods in our city. You have the map in your packet. Uh, it's the historic Northwest, Coleman Park, and Pleasant City. Uh, the way we uh, figured out how we were going to focus our efforts, the police uh, helped us with a heat map that showed where our most violent offenses took place. And it's no secret, you know, it's right off the, the Tamron Corridor. So that's why we have decided to focus our efforts here. But we really do believe it's a village. So as you look around, that's why you see all of these different pillars from education, health, reentry, uh, employment, training. You'll hear you know, more about those in a little bit, but it's really going to take a village. It's going to take all of our city's resources to really hone in on these three specific communities, uh, uh, black males in these communities, to help shape their outcomes. So we, uh, it, it's such a broad issue, um, and I think the mayor was smart by doing this. Initially, she's like, Kevin, let's focus only on a couple of things. So we uh, initially decided to focus our efforts on uh, workforce development uh, and crime prevention and intervention. So uh, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of this for you, but it really gives a, a background of some of the existing programs you know, that we currently have right now uh, through, through our job training um, dollars that we have provided you know, to the Urban League, um, to our Peace in the Street walks that we do, uh, community dialogues that we have with our police and young men in these neighborhoods. Uh, we have programs uh, that's already in action for first-time misdemeanors and first-time felony offenders. So we um, currently you know, have a lot of, of good things going on, but one thing that uh, Anthony Smith and C Cities United really challenged us with is really expanding our work and really putting together a, a, a violence reduction plan, a strategic plan for this targeted area uh, of the city. So that's how a lot of the other pillars um, that are already doing good work is at the table now. But I'm excited because it's three specific neighborhoods and it's, it's uh, you know, black males that we are concerned about. So we are pretty targeted um, with the work that we are doing. Um, some, some, you know, if you look at the second uh, page, you know, we have made some great efforts as it relates to public policy. I mean, you can read them from ban the box to a living wage and local hiring ordinance, uh, where we're really trying to put policy in place uh, to give these young men a chance in these neighborhoods. Um, as far as future programs, we are currently exploring a, a hospital-based uh, violence uh, intervention program. So these are for young men who are shot and do not die. Um, while they are at the hospital, um, we want uh, individuals from the community to really engage these young men and hopefully get them on a better track. But that's a, a national program that is getting a lot of, you know, catching a lot of, um, um, you know, uh, has really found its legs over the past few years. It's, it's pretty effective. Guys that are engaged in the hospital once they've been injured are less likely uh, to be re-injured or injure somebody. Um, and we also are looking at 
um, fairly soon uh, uh, developing a, a homicide response team or, or a community response team. We're not sure what we're going to call it yet. But in the event there is a homicide in the neighborhood, we want to be able to dispatch clergy and concerned community members uh, to these neighborhoods and to this, the point of the homicide to really let community members know that we love them and we care for them. We're getting ready to volunteer. Yeah, we will definitely need volunteers, so that, that'll be coming out in, in the near future. Um, but once again, um, the reason um, why we are gathering everybody, we really want to hear from you. We want to hear your voice. And the hope is once we hear the community's voice um, in, in concert with the work groups that have been established, uh, goals will be put in place. We'll have an actual document, a plan that we can present to funders, that we can present to the business community to see how they could assist us improving the outcomes of, of black males uh, in the north end of our city that uh, historically have been overlooked. So once again, we thank you all for coming. Uh, and it's uh, just a great honor. Um, this brother flew down specifically for this. I'm glad we, we it's warm and, and hopefully he may be able to put his feet, feet in the water for a little bit while he's here. But from Louisville, Kentucky, the Executive Director of Cities United, Mr. Anthony Smith. Let us receive him. So like Kevin said, this really is not about uh, Cities United, this is about West Palm Beach and about the work that you guys have been doing and will continue to do together. Uh, Cities United, uh, we support a network of mayors. Uh, we've got about 122 mayors that we're working with across the country. Uh, this year we've actually selected 40 cities that we want to go deeper dive with. West Palm Beach is one of those cities. Uh, and we really want to make sure that West Palm Beach has this comprehensive public safety plan. And we're calling it a comprehensive public safety plan because we want folks to think differently about public safety. When you hear public safety, you think about fire, police. We want you to think about prevention, intervention, reentry, because that's going to take all of that to make safe and healthy and hopeful communities, right? So when we talk about public safety plans, it's looking at prevention, intervention, enforcement that's smart, that does not criminalize folks for the rest of their lives, but then also how do we help people reenter back into the community and come back home? Uh, so we ask mayors and their cities to take a two-pronged approach. We know every day in this country we lose seven young men to gun violence between ages of 14 and 24. So every day you lay down, seven young men don't get up the next day. And for us, that's a crisis that we all should be concerned about and we all should be doing work about. Uh, so we're asking mayors to one, how do you interrupt that cycle of violence that's happening every day? Right, so when Kevin talks about the hospital-based intervention program, it's a model that we know works. You're capturing young people at that moment of crisis when they're ready to make a change in their lives at their hospital bed with folks who can reach them like Ricky and his team. They can really then have a solid plan with them. But you're also looking at this interrupter model where how do you get between two young men who are beefing with each other and figure out a way to squash that and work with them. But then there's also another model that we're also touting. It's called the advanced peace. How do you identify those known shooters in your community put them in a fellowship program that then takes them to a whole nother place, right? Uh, if you ever see, and it's out of Richmond, California, and if you ever see the headlines, and it says paying criminals not to shoot, uh, we like to think about it as helping put young men who didn't have opportunities into opportunities for they can have a better outcome. So we ask mayors to do that. That's the interruption piece. Up front, stop young men from dying today. But then two, that long-term work, of putting together this comprehensive plan that starts saying, how do we keep them from even getting into that pipeline and that cycle of violence, keeping them in school? So school's gotta be different, right? Young people don't just drop out of school because they wanna drop out. Something is happening inside of that schoolhouse that makes people not wanna go back, right? Make sure they're working. Kevin talked about workforce. When we talk about the unemployment rate across this country, when we think about young black men and boys, sometimes that's double, triple, Right, so we, we got a, in Louisville, we got a 4.2 unemployment rate for the city. But when you look at certain neighborhoods and you pull out certain po populations, it goes anywhere from 16% to 32%. And if you pull out just black men in some of those neighborhoods, it goes up to 50%. So we've got to be real clear that this is about systems change while we're also asking individuals to make change. And when Kevin talked about the neighborhoods, I'm gonna add a couple of more adjectives to go with there. There's a lot of disinvestment 
that has happened in those neighborhoods. There's a whole lot of uh, oppression that has happened in those neighborhoods and a whole lot of redlining that actually made it hard for folks to participate in the day-to-day -day life and uh, have the outcomes they want. So Cities United is here to think about all of that. We're a long-term partner with you all. We're here to the end. Uh, well, our goal is that Kevin was with us in February, Kevin and Ricky was with us in February, that West Palm Beach should have this plan within six months. And if we all work tight together and we really focus, you all are doing a lot of this work already. When you look through these, uh, the document to Kevin, a lot of stuff is happening. Our goal is to say, how do you now coordinate all of that so that it's working in partnership and not in silos, but it's also paying attention to those most impacted by violence, those most uh, pushed to the margins, those who usually don't get called to meetings and things like this, and those who we know are gonna have troubles uh, based on the system set up, making, their, making ends meet and making the dreams come true that they want. So we're just excited to be here. And again, like I said, this is not about Cities United, this is about the mayor and Kevin and the team here and the work that you all are gonna do in partnership. We just here to be a partner. Uh, we like to share best practices, so there's a lot of cities doing great work. Uh, as you heard, Kevin talked about the hospital-based plan. We know we help Louisville get their plan up and running. We help Minneapolis get their plan up and running. And they did that by going to see other people, so they do site visits. So if there's a team that's ready to go, we'll help coordinate that, help put some resources behind it to get you all to that city. Because at the end of the day, you've got to have these kind of programs up and running, but they've got to be attached to a full system. One plan, one thing is not gonna get this done and it's gotta be coordinated. And the reason we work with mayors is mayors have access to the budget, right? So when we start talking about we need programmatic stuff, it's not just the, the foundation money, we gotta allocate city dollars a little bit different than we've allocated before. They also have access to policy, right? So we can write different policies that have different outcomes uh, for, uh, for young folks. Uh, one of the policies that we always recommend that mayors look at, uh, Mayor Fisher and uh, a couple other mayors have put a policy in place for their staff. It's a mentor policy. We always talk about we need more mentors. We need more mentors. And one of the ways mayors can do that quickly is say to their teams, each team member can have time off to go mentor a kid, but be real clear about where you send those folks to mentor, right? So. We knew in Louisville that we had about 400 young black men on our waiting list at Big Brothers Big Sisters. So if you wanted to be a mentor through Louisville's mentor program, that's where you had to go. We also knew we had schools that were looking for folks to come and be a part of the reading program. That was another place you had to go. So being real clear and strategic about where you place folks and put folks is also key to this too. Uh, but also making sure that you build off what you have look and identify those gaps because we all have gaps and then figure out how you fill those up and the last thing i'll say that i think kevin said and it's important to know once you have this plan it's easier for funders and people who want to be uh, have, add resources to figure out where it goes a good friend of mine was with me last time i was here dorian dr dorian burton who's uh with the keenan charitable trust and florida is one of their cities i mean florida is one of their states and he's interested in West Palm Beach and we've got to figure out where and how we help him put money and resources in Florida and in West Palm Beach. He told me to make sure I told you guys hi. He knew I was coming today, but <laughs> one of our jobs is to make sure we help also identify national resources for you all as well, right? We know there's a, tons of local funders, but there's also a lot of national funders who are interested in Florida and West Palm Beach. And my job is to help you figure out how to get those resources. So let's get a solid plan. Don't worry about the money now. We want the plan to be the best plan possible, and I know we can find the resources, right? Not uh, because I think people would want to invest in something that they see is moving forward. So thank you all for your time. I'm really looking forward to all the good ideas that come out of this work, and we look forward to being with you on a long haul, especially in the winter time when I can come to Florida <laughs> <laughs> because it's cold and we just had snow in Louisville. So again, thank you all. The beauty of this initiative is that we're talking about a finite geographic area. So we're only talking about three communities. And I think that's huge. But we can't do that without the things that are already happening in the county. So I'm gonna ha ask that we hear a little bit about an initiative called Birth to 22 that it's been a, has been in existence in the county for a while now. And in a shortened version, Gita's gonna try and tell you what's been going on uh, with, with Birth to 22 and bring you up to speed on that. We can listen to that 
and talk about how we can integrate their work into this small community that we're working in. So Gita Jacobson, am I right? Yes. Yes, good. <laughs> From Youth Services. I will be very brief about, um, a, couple, a couple weeks ago actually, Marsha Guthrie had an opportunity to introduce Birth to 22 to a lot of the partners in this room uh, with the Mayor's Village Initiative. So I won't take a lot of time talking about Birth to 22 itself. I know one of the things that was really important and relevant to this group is to look at what data existed for West Palm Beach community, specifically the 33401, 33407 communities for the next three community conversations, and also to look at where we don't have that drill down disaggregated data, to at least look at a black male, which is the predominant uh, discussion that I think we are having in West Palm Beach. But for those of you that don't know what Birth to 22 is, it's a cradle to career approach where we are actually looking at kids being born healthy all the way to career ready. It's a collective impact approach that's collaborative in, in nature. For uh, the last four years, this alliance have engaged existing coalitions. We've engaged networks, youth service organizations, as well as the communities, the parents, and the youth. And it's good to see the youth in the room today because they were really critical in ensuring that we got to where we are. We cannot create programs and identify gaps and provide resources to our kids if they're not in the room to tell us what they want. And we were very strategic about ensuring that they were engaged in the conversations. We did go out and had 11 community conversations all over Palm Beach County where the young people were part of the discussions, they were part of the solutions, and they were orchestrating all of the conversations that was happening at their table. So I know that Kevin said that there are five pillars that West Palm Beach uh, Village Initiative is looking at. And I see a direct correlation between your five pillars and the six um, areas that we identified in our steps to success. And those six areas are around physical health, behavioral health, our academic readiness, uh, social emotional um, well-being, career readiness, and um, connecting and contributing. So, for employment and training, which is one of the ones that you've identified, <coughs> career readiness is right there on our stairs to success. Education, we've got ready for school, we've also got <coughs> meeting educational standards. Reentry and justice services is right over here by the hearing pro-socially. Health is across the board. You can go with born healthy or healthy and active. And the last is our crime prevention intervention, and that's also in this area over here, which is connected and contributing, as well as behaving pro-socially. I know there's a common theme across all of the five pillars, and that's about community and social awareness. And this also falls within this spectrum, and we can put it here, because we look at all of the social emotional well-being for kids. So one of the things that you guys will all have is, now, I actually have 84 slides. <laughs> you do not have 84 slides. And, and because I needed to make sure that the slides you're looking at is relevant to West Palm Beach. So the first, thing I, you, the first slide you'd be looking at is your community context. To give you a general idea of the percentage of black or African American in, in Palm Beach County. And the one that we're looking at is 18.4%. But if you go to your second page and you look at child population by age group, poverty level, and geographic area, you'll see that 33401. If you go all the way to the right column, 25.5% of the total population from 0 to 18 is in poverty in this particular geographical area. And I think we need to pay attention to what our demographics look like. We need to pay attention to where our resources are or where our lack of resources are, because if you're looking at gaps and you're looking at services, you need to meet the community where they are in order to be able to address the needs. 
when you look at food insecurity and resources for West Palm Beach, and you'll see that all of the geographical areas are combined, it hasn't been separated, that we have a food insecurity need index of a 0 0.9, pretty high. Um, continuing with community context, when you look at the, 10, the top 10 municipalities with highest reported crime rates, you'll see that the West Palm Beach Police Department has a total crime index of 6,553. It is the actual highest on this list. And it's not news that there has been some incidents of murder and robbery. It's the highest for larceny, the highest for burglary, the highest for aggravated assault. And it has increased by 6.6% .6 since last year. When we talk about health, we need to look at health across the, the board. So when, you, you, when you're talking about health, you're looking at, let's start with low birth weight. If you look at 2016, the black non-Hispanic population, not necessarily for West Palm Beach, but across Palm Beach County, has the highest rate of low birth weight across uh, Palm Beach County. The same thing for being born preterm. We have 11.9% this year for black non-Hispanic, and that again is the highest for Palm Beach County. Birth to teen mothers, 4.5%, the highest in Palm Beach County for black non-Hispanic. Infant mortality rate, 8.2%, again, the highest in Palm Beach County for black African American. And when you get to the next slide, you'll see the reasons for our uh, infant death. The five leading causes of uh, the reasons for infant death. We've got congenital disorders due to low gestation. So we talked about low birth weight. That's one of the reasons for uh, infant mortality, unintentional injury, and bacterial. For subsidized childcare services, the data is showing that 3.8% in West Palm Beach, 33401, this particular zip code, is receiving subsidized children childcare. So let's move on to school. We've talked about health. And, and I'm just providing the data because I know these are things that you need as you break out into your sessions later on to be able to discuss what are the things you need to identify for your community, where your gaps are, where the problems lie, where the solutions lie, and how to move forward. So as we look at Ready for School, um, the, the percentage of children entering kindergarten ready to learn for blacks in 2016 is 86.3%. I do see a drop from last year by about 3.3%. And when you get to the next slide, I do not have one for 33401 because it did not make below the, the county level, which is a 90% performing. But you'll see that for at least 33407, that it's performing um, that 88.2% of the, the kids are performing or are ready, ready to learn by kindergarten. So healthy and active. Um, in order to be healthy and active, some of our kids actually need health insurance, right? So that slide shows you the percentage of our kids that do not have health insurance. So therefore, they may not have access to proper health care. So for the number, the percentage of children under six without health insurance, we're looking at 9.5%. For the percentage of children between six to 17 years of age without health insurance, we're looking at 12.5%. And 18 to 24, 32%. One of the things that uh, the school district has done is, actually the Ch Department of Children and Families have done, is interviewed kids 
to find out how many of them would report whether or not they are using drugs and alcohol. And you'll see that according to Palm Beach County's report, high school students are 11.9% of them are self-reporting use of marijuana on, on, at school. Uh, absences. Um, the first slide you'll see tells you the percentage of children that's, that's absent from school 10 or more days. I always find this number to be startling. 31% of elementary school kids are absent 10 or more days from school in Palm Beach County. 31%. So that may be something that you need to look at as an issue to, to address with parents. 12% uh, of middle schoolers and 9% of high schoolers. When you get to the next slide, you'll see the breakdown by race and gender. For black males, of 10,584 that were enrolled, 2,950 of them were absent 10 or more days in Palm Beach County School, which is 27.87%. And this is elementary school. For middle school, the number is 10.17%. Suspensions. Black males have the highest total suspensions in Palm Beach County in elementary school. 1,170 suspensions for black males in elementary school in Palm Beach County. It's more than triple the next number, which is 339, and that would be black females. For black male suspension uh, in middle school, we're looking at 1,777 suspensions for black male suspension in middle school. The second highest to that would be Hispanic males. When you look at suspensions in high school, black males, 1,919 suspensions in high school, which is 15, with 15.73% being out of school suspension and 12% being in school suspension. Black female is the second highest with 1,121 uh, suspensions. 9.76% being out of school and 6.92 being in school suspension. I have a question. Um, because I'm not an educator, when you're talking about suspensions in, in the, and I'm sure somebody in the audience can answer, when you're in elementary, middle, and high school, who makes the decision of suspensions? Like, is this a subjective? random, I, you know, I'm not telling you, you're not telling me today type of situation, or is there a policy standard, check off each one of these boxes, and then once all 10 boxes are checked off, you get suspended. How does that work in, in the school? I don't know that I can speak for the school, but Dr. Robinson, can you answer that? Um, level one, level two, the minor, minor thing is that they were doing detention, uh, things like that. Level three and level four is going to be on simple offenses, whether it's uh, transport teachers, uh, aggression, anything like that. So once you get level three or four, which most of the suspensions are for, the kids are suspended. Uh, use profanity has been used now as one of the main levels to suspend the kid for in school now. So any use profanity towards a teacher is an automatic suspension whether it's a two-day or a ten-day, depends on how far so the this isn't is. a subjective thing. This is like everybody has yeah. the same yeah. rules. Every school has right. a, a behavior <laughs> that they go by. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So may I follow up? But the reality Absolutely. Is. <laughs> so there is there's a matrix, right? But there clearly is subjectivity applied. Exactly. Right? Yes. And so, I mean, because of what I've done to dig into those numbers even more, and we, like, our policy says for level one offenses, you shall not be suspended. However, when we dig into the numbers, we have some kids who've been suspended for level one offenses, right? 
So, and so if you ask the right questions to pull the right data, then we circle back around to those administrators. Is the administrators making the call, right? Um, in high school, it's classically the assistant principal. In middle school, is the classically the assistant principal. Elementary, APs and principals, that's like the common scenario. But um, the fact of the matter is, they don't always follow the policy. And um, so it's both, it's both. So. I, I do want to say, I looked at uh, the school suspension data today, and although we have a lot of work to do, all of the numbers are trending in the right direction, just slightly, slightly so. And the largest um, <coughs> decrease in suspension, when you look at elementary, middle, and high school, is for black males. So, but it's, you know, so with this, something we're doing is, is working, but we still, have a long way to go. If I, if I can continue. So if you go to the other slide, I know this is actually a, a topic that will probably take into our breakout sessions. So when we look at educational standards and we look also at English and math by grade eight, we're also seeing blacks being lower than all of the other areas uh, with graduation rate. There has been an increase of graduation rate from last year, 81% to 82%. Uh, with uh, blacks being 74, with 74% of blacks graduating. Um, there's a slide there for extracurricular activity and I think that's important when you're looking at re-entry and justice because if we don't provide pro-social activities for the kids and crime prevention, um, it's very difficult for them not to get into something that may be negative. So ensuring that we take a look at that. And when we look at juvenile arrests for 2016-2017, um, we'll see that th for zip code 33407, there was a total arrest of 150, with 12 of them being arrest in the school. Um, you'll see also that the largest population uh, the ages of arrest is from 12 to 17, to 18, sorry, with the largest arrest occurring at the age of 16 and 17. Uh, for total arrests in Palm Beach County for, 16, for fiscal year 16, 17, for black youth, the total arrest was 2,164, um, with 207 of that being school-related arrests and 1,957 being non-school-related related arrests. And the largest number of arrests actually in Palm Beach County is felony-related. I don't know if you guys realize that, but that's what it looks like. Since, since we've looked at all of this data, birth to 22, and our um, agencies that work together have started to do interventions and started funding different programmings. So there's been some contracted funding in all of the areas we've identified, and there's a lot of work doing, being done by the school district and a lot of other agencies that I'm aware of, and we'll be happy to be partnering with you all and pushing this forward. I know I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nina. Um, and the next person we want to hear from before, because we really want to get you to these flip charts, that's why we have you here this evening, uh, but we want to hear from the community. This work can't happen without the community, um, so we are going to ask their, our biggest community partner, uh, Ricky Aiken, to come up and talk with us. And I just bought my Hope Dealer shirt tonight, because I love that. Thank you. Now, I just want to say, um, is this, I don't need that. I just want to say, I just want to say how thankful I am uh, to see a room this full uh, around the topic of black men and boys. Um, it is my, my, my mantra that real change happens when the people who need it lead it. So if you know anything about me, you know that's what I'm about. When I was coming up in my community, the only role models I had in my community were the guys standing on the corner, the neighborhood dope dealers. Both of my older brothers spent combined over a decade in prison for drug charges. So when I grew up, that was the only path I thought I had in life. And now, because of all the great support I've gotten from many of people in this room, 
The only option that you got isn't just a dope dealer anymore. You can be a hope dealer. Each of these young men standing here today could have easily been standing on the street corner on your way here, but they're not. These guys are here, they're focused, and they're intentional about bringing good to their hood. I still live in this community, I grew up in this community, and if I could find the right wife, I'd be living in this community <laughs> for the rest of my life. But this ain't a fly-by operation. These guys know where I live, they got access to me 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and to know that we're being plugged into something that's not just happening in our city, but in our county, I got high hopes that we could create a model here in West Palm Beach that could be taken and shared around the country. So I'm super grateful for each and every person here, and I want to give one of my mentees an opportunity to say something. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Trey, and I attend Palm Beach Lakes Community High School, and I'm also here with Ricky as his younger cousin and also industry innovators. As you look around the room, who do you mostly see? and people that are older than I am, <laughs> basically. And as you look around, all of you are partnered with organizations that are targeted to youth. So if you are working with organizations that are targeted to youth, why aren't your youth here with you? That's one of my main questions. Because as you see, you guys said Tamron is the targeted community. And I feel as if if youth isn't here to give their input in the community they stay in, you guys can't really say what's going on in that community because it's a difference between you guys going into the community in which we or I stay in and walking around that community versus you going up to a person that you see on a corner daily saying, hey, what got you here while you're in this position? And I feel like that's the main reason why communities stay the same or as dormant as it is today. And Earlier, somebody mentioned that funding is the reason why communities are the same. Back then, before my time, Tamron was usually black business owned, which means people of color will support that business of color, which will bring profitability into that community. As you look around, you really don't see that anymore. So, youth like us, we try to come together and we try to bring up leaders in which we all try to be. I got an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. for the march. And I also went to the meeting that was held in Washington, D.C. And I got to share my input. It takes leaders like that to bring change about your community. So meetings like this, you should be here to advocate for us or for me in their community in which they stay in. And that's what I'm Thanks, sir. I think you're running out. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And add to that, I have to tell you that we said that we would see how many, we've invited multiple youth groups uh, to all three of these meetings. There's two more this week, one Thursday, one Saturday, bring them. And we were committed to, if we didn't get enough youth, to, if we didn't see enough youth this week, Kevin and I have, had already committed, uh, with your help, Inner City Innovators, to do one that's just young people. So we've made that commitment. So get as many as you can Thursday night and Saturday. We would love to have you. You're, you are who we want to listen to. Trust me. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to get to work. We said we wouldn't have you here more than two hours, and we won't. So we have... Oh, they're up around the walls. So we have, uh, we're going to break you up into groups. You were all given a, a colored card when you walked in. We knew that every, we would have a lot of interest in different topics, so we, we pre-selected you. So you all have a color card that coordinates to one of these sheets on the board, on the walls. Uh, we have some of our, we have some, thankfully, we have people in our community that have stepped up to be champions for each of these pillars. And I'm going to ask, Kevin, you're probably going to help me pick, the, going to need to help me pick them out. Our, our champion for education is? Daryl Houston. Daryl Houston. Is there, we have another one here? No. Just Daryl? Okay, Daryl's going to hang out over here at education. Uh, for employment and training, we have Bruce Lewis, if he can get out of custody. 
um, this evening. <laughs> they all have co-champions as well who may or may not be here this evening. For health, behavior, and physical, we have Sharon Green. Yes, okay, it's gonna be at that one. Crime prevention intervention, I'm sorry, reentry and justice system, I missed the biggie. Uh, we have Craig Spatera and that's it for, okay, that's it for that. Crime prevention and intervention, we have our chief and Ike Powell are working together on that one. And then there's another flip chart that Ricky's gonna man, and that's called communication and social awareness. Because one of the things we also realize is we don't know how to get the word out to the young people, that's clear. So we wanna understand how to, how to get the word out in this specific community to not only the young people, but to their parents and the residents as well. You all can tell us how to do that. I have no clue. Um, so what we're gonna ask you to do is to go with your to, to your given pillar that you've been assigned. Spend about 15 minutes there giving ideas to the pillar leader. Then we're gonna give you an opportunity to shift to a different pillar if you wanna add something. But let's spend the time to exhaust your group's ideas. We also have, before you move, we have post-it notes all up here. If there's something that you think needs to be added to one of the pillars that you didn't get an opportunity to get to, then please fill out a post-it note and put it up there. One more thing, we have sheets in the back of the room uh, because we don't want you to leave here without getting involved because we know you want to continually be involved in this. So we have sheets in the back of the room that will allow you to tell us where you want to get involved and how you want to get involved. Please fill those out. And the last thing I'll tell you, because I'm afraid once you break up in pillows, I might lose you. Um, we want to be able to follow this. So this is way out of my wheelhouse. We have a hashtag. I'm not quite sure what that means. But we got a hashtag. <laughs> so we can follow the West Palm Beach Village Initiative with the hashtag or through the Twitter or through the Facebook page. And I already feel people going, do I miss anything else before they start to move? Just want to acknowledge uh, police out there for me. We brought some young men as well from the neighborhood. So I just want to acknowledge these young men as well. So we appreciate you all. Man. Beautiful.